The Fanboy, episode 119. Hi everybody, Mario Francisco Robles, MFR here with you, and this is episode 119 of the Fanboy Podcast. How's everybody doing out there? Uh, I'm going to start things off with a quick peek behind the curtain, because you see, I actually filmed and recorded this entire episode yesterday, Thursday. I had 119 in the can, I was very happy with it, and I was just going to edit it and get it up to you guys this morning. And then Disney had to go and have that investor's call and basically blow the roof off the joint when it comes to crazy amounts of news about all things Marvel, about all things Star Wars, and even a little tidbit about Indiana Jones. And I realized I cannot release a brand new episode of the Fanboy Podcast this week without addressing that news. Because if I were to sit on that and wait for next week, I mean, what kind of commentator on these things would I be? So um, let's go ahead and, and break down some of the insane news that came out of yesterday's investors call. I'm going to go project by project, bit by bit that was announced, and uh, kind of give you my quick two cents on them, all right? Because yes, ye- yesterday Disney hosted a, some sort of investors call, and they re- they announced a ton of new stuff that's coming to Disney Plus and to theaters in the next two years. So the big headline that I saw coming out of Marvel yesterday is that finally, the Fantastic Four is coming to the MCU. That's right. We weren't sure if it was going to, how many years it was going to take for them to want to reintroduce those characters and do all that. But it looks like we, we got our answer. It's coming very soon. And it's coming from John Watts, the director of Spider-Man Homecoming and Spider-Man Far From Home. And since I know what I'm going to be saying later in this episode, because I filmed the uh, bits about Spider-Man 3 yesterday, uh, spoiler alert, I'm not a huge fan of John Watts, as you'll hear me discuss later on. But, you know, th- th- that sort of tempers my my excitement for this. You know, John Watts, to me, so far from what I've seen in his Marvel work, has been very serviceable. You know, I really enjoyed Spider-Man Homecoming, but it was primarily because of Tom Holland, primarily because of the script. You know, there wasn't anything about the way it was shot or directed that blew me away. But yeah, I thought it was a fine start. And John Watts was sort of a filmmaker that was now sort of on my radar. But, you know, not very close to the center. Just, okay, this John Watts guy exists and he gave me a pretty, you know, decent Spider-Man movie. Okay, John Watts. And then Spider-Man Far From Home came out. And to me, that was an uneven, bloated, stakes-free affair that just sort of muddied the water and sort of took Peter Parker back a few notches without exploring any remotely interesting ideas about where Peter Parker is psychologically after the events of Endgame. It, to me, Far From Home was just very okay. So when I hear about Fantastic Four coming to the MCU, my first instinct is, yay! And then my next thing when I see it's John Watts is to go, uh, really? So uh, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see how it works out. You know, I would love to give you like an alternate director right now who I feel should have done it. But uh, I'm not going to go there just yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think on that. And uh, because... I feel like there is someone out there with the right particular set of skills who's already demonstrated that they could probably do that project great justice. And uh, I'm going to think on that because I'm not sure John Watts is the guy. Um, Peyton Reed is apparently the guy to to come back again and do the third Ant-Man movie. Peyton Reed, who did Ant-Man, Ant-Man and the Wasp, is now returning to helm Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Which sees not just the return of all the regulars, but also the inclusion of Catherine Newton as Cassie Lang and Lovecraft breakout star Jonathan Majors as Kang the Conqueror. So that's pretty epic sounding. And I got to tell you, giving Ant-Man a second chance, this time with my kids, 
really helped because when I saw it in theaters, I thought, all right, this was all right. You know, if I typically think of Marvel as sort of lightweight and toothless, uh, Ant-Man was like the epitome of that when I saw it on my own with a couple of my guy friends. But then when I saw it again with my kids and more of like a family friendly setting and saw how much they enjoyed it and how much they laughed and giggled and enjoyed all the stuff with the giant ant and all that stuff. And I realized like, Truth be told, that seems to be who this story is aimed at. You know, Ant-Man was always meant to be like lighter and funnier. I mean, Marvel's already light and funny, but even lighter and funnier than your typical Marvel fare trying to appeal to a younger subset of the fandom. So giving Ant-Man that second shot really helped. And then seeing Ant-Man and the Wasp the following week... Um, you know, I, I'm actually somewhat of a fan of those movies now. So I'm glad that Reed is going to get to come back and sort of conclude a trilogy there. The next big bit of news was that Rachel McAdams, who I adore, I used to have like the biggest Hollywood crush on Rachel McAdams. You know, I, I was never one to be all that crazy about celebrities because there's that part of my brain that's like, don't get too invested. You're never going to meet this person. All right. You find them pretty and admire them from afar. But Rachel McAdams, I was like in love with. You know, every time she had an interview, every movie she did, I would just stare at the screen and swoon at her. You know, there was a part of me that's like, I would give anything to meet her one day in my mouth breathing mid to early 20 days. Um, but yeah, so she's officially coming back to Doctor Strange. There was originally some thought that she would not be back for the sequel. But yesterday it was confirmed that Rachel McAdams will return for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So that's exciting to me. There's an interesting bit of news, though, about Black Panther 2 that I'd like to address. Because I'm not sure how well it sits with me. But first, I'll tell you the news. Um, they announced, essentially, that they will not be recasting Chadwick Boseman as T'Challa. And that instead, Black Panther 2 will come out on July 8th, 2022. But it's going to revolve around other characters within the Black Panther universe. And to me, that just strikes me as very odd. I feel like if you're going to do that, then don't call it Black Panther 2. Call it Wakanda. You know, call it something else. Because if you call it Black Panther 2, the expectation is people are going to want to see the Black Panther. And even if it's not Chadwick Boseman as, as T'Challa, uh, you know, I, I'm firmly in the camp that that's an important character and they need to figure out a way to bring him back. You know, or they need to you know, use the comics precedent and give us a different person under the mantle of Black Panther. Thankfully, there already is somewhat of a convention in the movies, right? Because his father passed it down to him. So it is something that can be passed on. But unfortunately, you know, obviously we don't have Bozeman around anymore. May he rest in peace to film whatever transfer, you know, whatever passing of the torch he would have to do. So then you'd have to rely on some sort of Hollywood trickery. And I feel like that would not go over terribly well. But I just feel like you got to find a way to get T'Challa back in the mix of things or give us a brand new Black Panther to root for. To simply, you know, set it, you know, center it on some other characters from within that universe and just act like T'Challa is just not really part of this story. I mean, listen, I guess I'll reserve judgment until I see what Ryan Coogler has in mind. He's a very talented writer and director. So maybe he's got an approach that's going to blow me away. But my first instinct upon hearing that Black Panther 2 is still coming out but without T'Challa factoring in at all, I just kind of wonder, like, what are we really doing here? Um, then there were a couple of new TV shows for Disney Plus that were announced, like Secret Invasion with Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury and Ben Mendelsohn coming back as the Skrull Talos from Captain Marvel. Like, hello. Oh, speaking of which, they also did announce Captain Marvel 2, and it's going to be directed by Nia DaCosta. Brie Larson obviously will be returning for better or worse. Uh, Tiana Paris, who's going to be playing Monica Rambeau in the Disney Plus series WandaVision, is now you know, the, the, the grown-up Monica Rambeau. Now she's going to get to play that role again in Captain Marvel 2. So that's kind of neat, right? That's pretty cool. Uh, and I did, you know, I was reading some stuff this week about how those Disney Plus series really are going to be much more intrinsically linked 
to Marvel's cinematic outings. So that kind of intrigues me too, right? Because that was always one of the big complaints that us fans had about Marvel TV, which was that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. launched as a companion piece to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It had Agent Coulson in it, and we all got excited thinking, wow, so there's a TV leg of this story that I could watch, and it'll be, you know, it'll be, it'll... It'll enhance my experience of the movies. I'll, I'll have a deeper understanding of the stories. This will flesh out other corners of the MCU. This is so cool. But then little by little, we started realizing that Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. really doesn't have any connection, you know, aside from a very cosmetic one early on, especially as it pertains to Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and the whole Hail Hydra arc. But really, aside from that, there was close to no relationship between that series and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Same thing with Daredevil and, and all those other Defenders characters on Netflix, where at first, you know, Daredevil seemed to launch in the shadow of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They referenced the Harlem incident with Abomination. You know, they, 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 they leaned into the Avengers, you know, the, the uh, invasion on the cent you know, that happened at the end of Avengers. They referenced in Daredevil. So once again, we're kind of thinking, oh, wow. So these are a little more intimate stories set within the greater Marvel Cinematic Universe. And then what happened? Once again, we noticed a few seasons in, like, wait a minute, there's not really any connection whatsoever. So what are we doing here? Uh, but what's cool about the Disney Plus stuff, as Kevin Feige pointed it out in a in recent interview, which is that it, it's being developed by like the same, you know, by, by like the same in-house team of creatives. And so the synergy between them is going to be much more apparent. And they even said that like WandaVision in certain ways is going to set up the events of Doctor Strange. So that's already interesting right there, right? Because WandaVision is going to give us the Tiana Paris as the grown-up Monica Rambeau. And then she's going to cross over into Captain Marvel 2. And yet that series is also going to lay some seeds for Doctor Strange 2. So pretty interesting stuff. And I'm very, you know, I, I'm, I'm wondering how it is that they're going to handle all that. But, you know, I'm all for synergy between the big and small screens. Um, then there's Armor Wars, where Don Cheadle will be coming back as War Machine, as James Rhodes, and exploring what happens when Tony Stark's tech falls into the wrong hands. Which, of course, kind of sounds like we've, you know, we, we've kind of been there, right? The first couple of Iron Man movies were Iron Man versus another guy in a mech suit. Like we've kind of seen what happens when other, you know, when his enemies have Stark like technology and then, it, you know, and then even technically the whole plot of Age of Ultron is what happens when things go awry with Tony Stark's technology. So this feels a little bit like a retread of the idea of Tony Stark's, you know, uh, good intentions uh, exploding in his face. But, you know, we'll see. I love Don Cheadle. And if an actor of that caliber, if freaking Mr. Hotel Rwanda, Don Cheadle himself, if, if, if Basher from uh, Ocean's Eleven himself wants to come back and do a whole series as War Machine, then I'm willing to give it a shot because that's a serious actor. And if he's going to do this, uh, let's do this. Um, and then there's Ironheart, starring Dominique Thorne as Riri Williams. That series follows the creator of the most advanced suit of armor since Iron Man. Um, okay, you know, I, I've seen the pictures. I know Ironheart's a pretty cool deal in the comics. I don't, I'm not too familiar with the character or with who Riri Williams is, but sounds cool. You know, it's, it's uh, good to know it's coming. The next thing that there's a couple of one-offs. I Am Groot is coming. It's a series of shorts featuring baby Groot and several new and unusual characters. Um, cool. Listen, I am you know, Groot was the, the big breakout star of, of the first two Guardians movies, especially the first one. You know, everyone was obsessed with baby Groot and him dancing at the end of the movie. And uh, listen, I, I, I get why they would want to milk that uh, that character a little bit. And I have a feeling that these Groot shorts will probably be aimed squarely at kids on the Disney Plus streamer, you know. Um, and then James Gunn is going to write and direct the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, uh, which he said will be canon. 
And uh, I'm pretty excited about that because James Gunn is one of these filmmakers who, you know, was definitely inspired by Star Wars back in the day. And we know George Lucas, you know, eventually there was the Star Wars Christmas special, which Lucas himself wasn't really all that involved with, I think. But, you know, it, it's become like an oddity and a curiosity to Star Wars fans for these last 40 years to the point where, like, Lucas once had to, I, I think, had to comment about whether or not it was canon. And that's why Gunn already commented that his Guardians uh, holiday special will be canon. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of, like, fun, sort of tongue-in-cheek, dry, sort of uh, absurd James Gunn-style humor in that and I can't wait. I hope it looks kind of live. I hope it looks like it's filmed on a, on a, in a studio and that it feels a little stilted. I really hope so. But we'll see what happens. And they officially confirmed that Christian Bale is returning to the realm of superheroes. He's going to be in Thor, Love, and Thunder. We knew that. And we'd heard rumors of who he was playing, but now it's confirm, confirmed, confirmed that he will be playing Gore, the God Butcher. So, hello. Christian Bale coming back. I mean, that's a pretty big deal. A part of me, you know, who who remembers what a sort of problematic uh, and very opinionated star he's always been makes me feel like the only way he agreed to do this if is if it's like primarily voice acting. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if this gore, the God Butcher, is not necessarily a flesh and blood character. I'm not saying this from any sort of knowledge. I don't even know who gore, the God Butcher, is. I should probably look him up. But just something tells me, no matter what gore, the God Butcher, is, do not be surprised if he ends up being like an all-CG character so that Christian Bale can primarily just do like some motion capture and voice him. Because the idea of Bale wanting to spend another, you know, two or three months in some sort of crazy suit in a comic book movie again, an actor of his caliber after all of that he all that he's given us through the Dark Knight trilogy, I just have a hard time seeing him coming back in the flesh and blood. But we'll see. We'll see. And the other big thing was, you know how I referenced the abomination fight from the Hulk? Well, Tim Roth is coming back as abomination in the She-Hulk series. And Mark Ruffalo, who kind of cautioned people to not get too excited about this news. He said, you know, they're still trying to find the right way to involve him in the series. But it looks like more or less a lock that Mark Ruffalo has agreed in principle to appear in the She-Hulk TV series that we'd heard about that is starring Tatiana Maslany. Uh, I am very intrigued for that. I've always been a Hulk person. And listen, if we're not going to gret, if we're not going to gret, if we're not going to get uh, a dynamic series of solo films for the character, then I'm very thrilled that maybe at least She-Hulk will get, you know, we'll have a nice series that explores some of the same facets of the character that I really enjoy. You know, because I, I've spoken about this before, but I'm a sucker for that, like, Jekyll and Hyde dynamic. That's why I've always loved The Incredible Hulk. I've always loved Jekyll and Hyde. I've always loved uh, the mythology of, like, the Wolfman. You know, anything where you have a common person who is trying to fight this monster that's within him that comes out. I think that's a pretty neat thing, especially if you write it intelligently and the whole thing is kind of a metaphor in a way for those of us who feel like there's another be you know beast living within me that I have to protect the rest of the world from. Not that I feel that way or anything, but, uh, you know, I just I've always loved characters that have that sort of like duality. So I hope She-Hulk, and that's the thing with, with an actress like Maslany. Um, you got to think that, you know, because she comes from Orphan Black, she comes from some pretty hard hitting stuff. So you've got to think that you don't hire an actress like that if this is going to be like fluffy and lightweight. So hopefully uh, this will be something almost like the Bill Bixby TV series, but obviously, you know, contemporary and with a woman's touch to suit that character. But, you know, what I always loved about the original um Bixby series was that you know it was more thoughtful it was more character driven it wasn't so much about the spectacle of seeing him hulk out and destroy stuff which was always obviously cool and the highlight of any episode but the build up to it and the storyline you know ramping up the tension around you know the story 
of the plot of each episode. That was always what made it so intriguing. You know, when is he going to Hulk out? Why is he going to Hulk out? Is you know, is he going to ruin something, or is he going to you know? It's just it's. Uh, I I I would be curious to see if that works. And by the way, speaking of like if that works. It's, it's going to be an interesting merging of worlds in a way, right? Because Tim Roth's abomination didn't fight Mark Ruffalo. He fought Ed Norton. So, you know, I guess this is a way, too, of like, you know, going above and beyond to make very clear that, yes, the Incredible Hulk is canon in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You know, that's why we have General Thunderbolt Ross, who showed up in the, in the a couple movies since then. And uh, because I know it still persists to this day where I see people asking online, like, is the Incredible Hulk canon or not? Or is it like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where it was canon, but not really anymore? But uh, bringing Tim Roth back, I feel like that's, you know, that solidifies its status within the overall Marvel arc. And uh, to now perhaps get to see Tim Roth and Mark Ruffalo share a screen that'll be uh i guess i feel like that would be a cool way to once and for all sort of merge the incredible hulk into the timeline um so we'll see what happens uh now we're going to move over to the star wars end of things because my god there were a lot of interesting things that came out of star wars on this call uh you know the big headline the big main line thing is that hayden christensen is returning to the role of Darth Vader for Obi-Wan Kenobi, the limited series starring Ewan McGregor. So we're going to have Hayden Christensen. We're going to have Ewan McGregor. We're going to have, you know, the Darth Vader and Obi-Wan Kenobi that we were shown in the prequels. Now we're going to get to see a story that is set 10 years after the events depicted in Revenge of the Sith. Um... My first response to that is, oh my goodness. Yes, 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 yes. I'm very excited for this. I, I've been wanting to see the continued adventures of Kenobi for a very long time. Ever since I heard about the possibility of a Kenobi movie or series, you know, the idea of exploring that time between Sith and A New Hope when he's, you know, what happened to Obi-Wan during that age of his life. I'm kind of intrigued by, especially, you know, if, if, if we're going to get into what it must be like as a master to have your Padawan, to have your student go to the dark side in such a way, in such grand fashion, murdering younglings and doing all the terrible things, you know, it's going to be uh, fascinating to watch an actor like McGregor play this sort of hardened, hurt veteran Obi-Wan on his way to becoming Luke's Padawan in the next movie, you know, that takes place after this story. So I'm very excited by the prospect of the series. I'm very excited by Hayden Christensen returning. I do have questions, of course, because, you know, by the end of Revenge of the Sith, he was already fully in the suit and James Earl Jones was voicing him. And we don't really make a habit of seeing Vader without his helmet. You know, really, you know, when the helmet went on at Revenge of the Sith, we, you know, aside from that little tease, I think, in Empire Strikes Back where he's in that chamber and we see the helmet, you know, lock in place with his back to the camera. It's not really a common thing that we see him without his helmet because he needs it to survive. It's his ventilator. That's what makes it such a big deal in Return of the Jedi. When he's dying and the helmet comes off and he says, you know, let me see you with my own eyes and all that stuff. So... I guess I bring all that up because I'm going to feel weird if if there's a lot of helmetless Darth Vader in this Kenobi series. You know, if he's just walking around talking and confronting Obi-Wan with his helmet off. Like, I don't think that's going to be the, the case. Because on top of that, then you really need to have James Earl Jones playing Darth Vader because you would need the voice. But they're saying that Hayden is coming back to play Anakin Darth. And a part of me wonders if he's not actually playing Darth Vader. Like maybe at some point Kenobi will encounter a Darth Vader. Um, but I wonder if the main reason they're bringing him back 
is that it'll be more like flashbacks or even just like 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 a ghost in Kenobi's mind, right? Like not a force ghost because he's not dead, but I wonder if they're going to bring him back in sort of that way, like where, while Kenobi is out in the desert, you know, in Tatooine trying to make peace with with the. Uh, mistakes he made and all that sort of stuff he almost you know he feels the presence of his young you know he remembers anakin the good pure anakin and that's kind of who he speaks to when he's alone you know in the in the desert you know but we'll see we'll see how they play it out it's a very neat bit of news on its own to have hayden christensen returning and speaking of actors who need um redemption right that's been something i've spoken about in recent weeks uh, yeah, I know Hayden Christensen, you know, his career, instead of taking off because of Star Wars, it kind of got derailed. So it would kind of be interesting. It would be very rewarding, I should say, if he was playing Anakin again, which he is, but that it went over very well and that he was able to sort of kind of finally put the stilted sort of um, cardboard performance of Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith behind him and sort of, you know, end his legacy with the character on a high note. You know, almost kind of like when Brandon Routh got to come back and play Superman last year and got to really kind of do it justice with all of the maturity that he now has. I would love to see Hayden Christensen now step back into Anakin and uh, bring a little extra weight to it, you know. So I'm excited by that. Another thing I'm excited about is there seems to be some goodness coming out of the creative team behind The Mandalorian. And that's a big deal because to me, I've been saying for the last few weeks, I think I even said it on this show, that if you can get me more Filoni, Favreau, Star Wars projects, you're giving me everything. You're giving me everything and anything I could ever want. Because to me... Favreau and Filoni really are this generation's Star Wars storytellers. They are the ones, that's the team that I think should be in charge of Star Wars moving forward. You know, and now that Lucas is gone, if we're going to have a central creative architect for the Star Wars galaxy, Filoni and Favreau have already shown that they have all the necessary tools to do that through The Mandalorian. That's why I'm excited to hear that they're going to have a spinoff for Ahsoka starring Rosario Dawson. And meanwhile, I haven't even gotten to see her episode on The Mandalorian yet because I've been working so hard these last, you know, this last week or so that my wife and I haven't gotten to watch any of our shows. So, uh, you know, it's a shame to be even talking about this when I haven't seen her in the flesh yet. It's a spoiler. But then again, I'm not going to be too like blown away because I never watched The Clone Wars. So I've just seen pictures of Ahsoka. I know she's a fan favorite character and I love the novelty of her making the leap from animation to live action. And I love Rosario Dawson. So, you know, I'm excited for this news, even if I'm not like a long time Ahsoka fan. But she's getting her own live action series from the Mandalorian team. And the other is Rangers of the New Republic. An original series, and uh, they haven't announced much about it. They've been a little tight-lipped about that one. But once again, it's being overseen by Filoni and Favreau, and I am, I'm here for that all day, every day. Um, and now this is real cool. This is real cool. Donald Glover is going to get to return as Lando Calrissian in a series called Lando from uh, Dear White People creator Justin Simeon. And that's an early development right now. And uh, listen, I don't think anyone who saw Solo, a Star Wars story, can argue that Glover was not a perfect casting for Lando and that he wasn't very fun and magnetic to watch. And I feel like, by the way, Lando is going to give us a chance to see more of Alden Ehrenreich's Solo. You've got to imagine that somewhere in that series, they might cross paths again. So I'm excited for that because, listen, Solo, A Star Wars Story is one of the better Star Wars movies. You know, people may not give it its due, but I've now seen it like three or four times. And it's just a great time. And it's a really cool story. It was totally unnecessary. And it's weird seeing Solo with, you know, without Harrison Ford. But... It was a totally kick-ass Star Wars movie. So if Lando is going to kind of let us explore that space a little more, 
I'm all for it. Then there's the new series, The Acolyte, a female-led mystery thriller that will take viewers into a galaxy of shadowy secrets and emerging dark side powers in the final days of the High Republic. And that comes from Leslie Headland, who, who gave us Russian Doll. Um, see this to me? This and the next one, so I'll read the next one and then I'll tell you what I'm so excited about. You know, this and Star Wars Visions, an original series of animated short films celebra celebrating the universe through the lens of the world's best Japanese anime creators, as well as a droid story, an adventure film with Lucasfilm Animation and Industrial Light and Magic teaming to create an epic journey that will introduce us to a new hero guided by R2-D2 and C-3PO. These kinds of projects, to me, are what I was talking about last week. This is the stuff, folks. This is the promise of Star Wars fulfilled. This is what I've been looking forward to, getting to see a new team of creatives explore completely new corners and facets of that galaxy far, far away. And this news just really takes that feeling and amps it up to the 10th degree. Because look at all these great projects. I, th I think they said in all that there were going to be 10 Star Wars projects TV series and 10 Marvel TV series on Disney Plus. And what a neat way to expand these universes. And, you know, I'm just, I'm so excited. You know, and they also released a clip for The Bad Batch, that animated series, and a little featurette on uh, Diego Luna's, not, not Diego Luna. Yeah, uh, Cassian Andor TV series, Andor. So a lot of cool stuff came out of Star Wars yesterday and, and Marvel. But there was one other part of all this that I'd love to touch on. And that's that Lucasfilm, which is also owned by Disney, got a little bit of love where Indiana Jones is officially on the way. The final Indiana Jones. It'll be starring Harrison Ford, and it'll be directed by James Mangold. That's right. The James Mangold who gave us 310 to Yuma. The James Mangold who gave us Logan. The James Mangold who gave us Ford versus Ferrari. So James Mangold is a serious, serious next-level filmmaker. To me, Logan still stands as one of the great films of the 2010s. And I, I, I draw a correlation between that project and this one because it's been said that this is going to be the swan song, that this is Harrison Ford's farewell to the role. And what was Logan? Logan was Hugh Jackman's farewell to that role. And we know that we know the gravitas and, and heft that James Mangold brought to Logan. It, it felt like... This veteran, you know, it, it had this very interesting way of breaking down what it's like to be a person who's lived an insane life and now going out for one last run and trying to like make peace with mistakes of the past while also, you know, inadvertently reliving the greatest moments up until then and kind of just being like an interesting post-mortem and final chapter for a beloved character. So if he can bring any of Logan's depth to Harrison Ford's last run as Indiana Jones, uh, I think, you know, I think we all win. And no matter what, I love Harrison Ford and I love James Mangold. So even if this wasn't an Indiana Jones movie, even if it was just, you know, James Mangold is directing Harrison Ford going to Target to buy some apples, uh, I would watch that. I would watch that a great deal. As long as Christian Bale is waiting for him there and they have to have a fight, it'd be great. But anyway, so yes, th th there's a lot of very cool news that came out of this Disney call. And there is so there are so many exciting things on the way. But uh, now I got to talk about something where someone's not so excited about the future. Someone's feeling pretty pissed about something that's coming up in 2021. Someone probably doesn't care one bit of a damn about any of this Marvel, Star Wars, or Indiana Jones news. And that's Christopher Nolan. That's right. Since we last spoke, ever since the news came out last week that Warner Brothers would be releasing all 17 of its planned 2021 releases to HBO Max on the same day and date that they arrive in theaters, ever since that news came out, 
Christopher Nolan's been throwing a little bit of a hissy fit. So we're going to start off today's show with some quotes, some choice quotes from Christopher Nolan made to The Hollywood Reporter. In a statement, Christopher Nolan said, Some of our industry's biggest filmmakers and most important movie stars went to bed the night before thinking they were working for the greatest movie studio and woke up to find out they were working for the worst streaming service. Warner Brothers had an incredible machine for getting a filmmaker's work out there, both in theaters and in the home. And they are dismantling it as we speak. They don't even understand what they're losing. Their decision makes no economic sense. And even the most casual Wall Street investor can see the difference between disruption and dysfunction. Now, I've certainly got some things I would love to say to that, and I'm going to. But first, I think there's another director whose opinion on this matter might be interesting because there's someone else who reacted to this and I, I'm going to let her response kind of show you where I'm going to go with this. Here's Wonder Woman 1984 director Patty Jenkins' response to this whole bold move to bring all of Warner Brothers right to the comfort of your home via HBO Max. She said, If you had told me a year ago that we would ever go straight to streaming in any way, shape, or form, I would have flipped out. Like, I'm not for that plan in general, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm very pro-theatrical release, and I will be that again as soon as this is over. However, this is such a crazy year. It's such a crazy year. It's like all of us are trying to figure out with our lives how to do everything the best we can. And so I kept saying there is no good option. Like, when we would talk about it, there was no good option. Wait until when? And then every movie in the world tries to come out at the same time. And, you know, there was no good option. I literally gasped a little bit when the pitch for this idea was said. Because I was like, oh, the idea of it going into people's homes on Christmas Day. I was just like, you know what? That's actually pretty incredible to get to share whether, you know, it's Christmas for people or not the holiday season. And in this moment, to just try to reach people however they can see it. So that's what Patty Jenkins thought of it. And I kind of want to I want to focus on that because I think it's a rather sort of beautiful response to this news because she makes very clear, first of all, that she's not a fan of this move in general and under normal circumstances. But these are not normal circumstances, are they? And that little bit about how she gasped when this was pitched. At first, you might read that thinking she might have gasped because she couldn't believe that it's come to this. That she couldn't believe that her baby, Wonder Woman 1984, she's been working on for the last two years, was now coming to HBO Max. She might have gasped for that. But no, that's not why she gasped. She gasped because, oh, the idea of it going into people's homes on Christmas Day. See, that, that strikes very uh, close to home for me. Because in another life, I was a creative artist, right? I was an actor. I was a director. I would sing and dance and act on a stage. And I know firsthand what it feels like just to share your work with the largest audience possible. No matter what you're getting paid, no matter how many, you know, no matter what all of the other business ends of things are, to be able to present your work that you've poured your passion and your energy and all of your talent into, to share that with the widest audience possible is arguably why anyone does it. You know, listen, the money and the fame and the accolades and the mansions and Beverly Hills and all the fame and glitz and glamour, that's all amazing. But at the end of the day, creative artists just want eyeballs and ears to enjoy their work, to examine all of what they've put into something and to enjoy it and to walk away from it having an opinion and talking about it. I mean, that is honestly the greatest thing that any creative artist can hope for. And what I love about Patty Jenkins' response to this is she looked at it more from that vantage point. She wasn't worried so much about, but what about the box office numbers? Or what about, what does this mean for the theatrical industry as a whole? No, she, she took this more as, oh my goodness, 
This very special movie that I worked on is now going to stream directly into all of these households on Christmas Day. This is a gift. This is wonderful. We're in a situation here where we don't know when this would have ever made it into theaters. So for now, we're going to make this a special holiday event film. This is going to be the one true event film of 2020. While all the other blockbusters and all the other franchises put everything on hold until next year, the biggest movie of 2020 is going to be Wonder Woman 1984. And that's not lost on Patty Jenkins. Because folks, let's really think about it. Who is really losing out on this? It's not us. It's these types of people that the Hollywood Reporter referred to several times in their piece on Christopher Nolan's response to all this. They keep referring to profit participants. That's right, profit participants. And in case you're unsure what that means, there are people who make their money on the back end of the movie. You know, there are certain performers who get paid up front, you know, certain creative types who all get their money up front. And then there are certain producers and key executives and sometimes even actors like Robert Downey Jr. and other situations, you know. But there are certain people who fall under the banner profit participants, where they're not only getting paid up front for what they did, but they're also going to get paid on the back end based on the box office receipts. So last I checked, unless I missed something in my, in my email, I am not a profit participant on any of these Warner Brothers movies. And I'm going to go out on a limb, but I don't think you are a profit participant either. So really, the average consumer is not being harmed in any way by any of this. On the contrary, all that's happening here is that Warner Media is doing the smartest thing they can do. Rather than letting these projects just languish in endless delays, because listen, we don't know how much longer it's going to take for life to get back to normal, you know, and while there are definitely encouraging signs on the way, we still don't know what it's going to be like. And we still don't know what kind of a rush people are going to be in to get back to theaters when this is all over. You know, this has been a traumatizing year for a great many people around the world. So... With that in mind, Warner Media is allowing us, the consumer, allowing you, allowing me to enjoy these wonderful movies that we're excited to see from the comfort of our own home for 15 bucks a month. So we are doing nothing but winning. Now, the industry folks, the people on Christopher Nolan's end of things, the people who participate in the profits on the back end of a movie, they're going to be pretty pissed. And the theater chains themselves are going to be pretty pissed. But you or I, the average fan, is doing nothing but winning in this situation. And if part of all of this is, but what about movie theaters? What about the theatrical experience? Listen. This all goes back to something I've been saying ever since this show came back, about two months ago now. The future of theaters is not for Hollywood to decide. The future of theaters is for you and I to decide. When things get back to normal, it's going to be entirely on us to show up and support and go to see movies in theaters. And that will dictate how many theater chains we need, how many theater locations we need, and what the theatrical experience itself needs to be in order to appeal to a post-COVID audience. This is going to be a whole new ball game after this. But at the end of the day, there's nothing we can really do to change that or affect that. Things were heading this way before coronavirus. This, is, this has been years in the making, this move towards getting movies directly to consumers and cutting out the middleman known as the movie theater. This has been going on a very long time. And the only way to justify keeping movie theaters in the fray and in the mix at all is by us showing up and watching movies in theaters, not pirating things and encouraging you know, fellow cinephiles to do the same. But there's no choice that a movie executive is going to make today that's going to decide what the theatrical experience looks like post-COVID. 
It's just impossible. There's too many unknown variables. And the model as we know it was going to change to begin with. So we can either keep trying to fight these winds of change. We can start getting all high and mighty and taking the sides of the Hollywood executives and elite level filmmakers and actors who are going to have, you know, temper tantrums about this. We, we, can, we can choose to want to fight their fights for them. Or we could look at our vantage point from where we sit, from our homes, from our cars, from our couches, from wherever we are right now, from our cubicles at work. From our vantage point, we get to see movies that we want to see as fans directly at home for 15 bucks a month, thanks to HBO Max. And I assume other streamers are eventually going to jump on that sort of bandwagon too. So as I get asked to care and, and fight this fight on Christopher Nolan's side of things, all I can think of is what's in it for me. I'm in a pretty good spot. As a fan, you and I, all of us, are sitting pretty right now. So let's just not fight their fights for them. You know, in, in all kinds of uh, facets of life, the wealthy, the powerful, love to try to get the common person to fight for them, to feel for them. Even though at the end of the day, what is Nolan really asking us to do? He's asking us to rush into theaters amidst a pandemic to watch a superhero movie? Or in his case, Tenet, you know, a spy movie? Like, he's not thinking about the common person. He's not thinking about you or I. He's thinking about this romanticized notion of what going to the theaters is. And listen, I, I agree. I have a romanticized notion of what it means to go to a theater too. But he's fighting for this romanticized notion and he's fighting for his own self-interest because he is the very type of filmmaker who would be a profit participant, who would make a bunch of money on the other side. So... He's not fighting for you or I. He's fighting for himself and his other powerful Hollywood pals. And while those people figure out how their archaic model is going to have to evolve, we get to reap all the benefits. So let them keep complaining. Let them keep complaining. It doesn't affect us. And something I think about, too, when I think about this whole matter is... I equate it to other types of things that have gone out of style. You know, eventually what happened to video stores like Blockbuster? People were complaining, oh my God, they're closing all the Blockbusters. Okay, but where do you see your movies? On Netflix. Oh, interesting. I know people, even my own wife, who complain about the closures of bookstores and they'll lament, oh my God, did you hear that the, the Barnes and Noble in Forest Hills is closing? Now there's only one Barnes and Noble bookstore in all of New York. And I go, yeah, that is sad. But um, where do you get all your books from? Amazon. Oh, interesting. So it's like people love to like complain and lament and wax nostalgic about the things that they loved and that they were used to doing. But are they willing to put up? If not, it might be time to shut up. And that's a very big, important part of this equation, too, because I was recently on the Shanlian on Batman podcast, which you guys should check out. I had a great conversation with Justin and Kyle. We went into Zack Snyder's Snyder Cut. We talked about Wonder Woman 84. We talked about Matt Reeves, the Batman. We talked about DC's future on film. We, we talked about a lot, a lot of things. But one of the things that came up was this whole issue. And on this subject, I was very happy to point out that the movie going experience, if anything, is going to be heightened after this. You know why? Because the people who go to theaters are going to be the people who really want to be there. there it's not going to be the obnoxious folks who don't take movies seriously. It's not going to be the folks who speak loudly during the movie. It's not going to be the folks who play with their bright phones on in the middle of the movie. It's not going to be the people who shout out spoilers or do obnoxious things. Those people who clearly do not respect the theatrical experience to begin with, those people will get to enjoy the movies clearly how they'd prefer to 
by being in their own living rooms. Because right, because they use the movie theater like it is their own personal living room. These kinds of selfish moviegoers who have turned off so many people from the theatrical experience. When you speak to people who don't like theaters, it's not that they don't like going to the movies, it's that they don't like the kinds of people who go to them, that it interferes with their viewing process. It, it, it interferes with their ability to engage with the movie and enjoy the movie, that you have a lot of people who screw up the experience. Well, something tells me that this is going to basically weed those kinds of people out of the mix. Because again, the folks who don't care won't come. The folks who love the theatrical experience, they're going to be people like you or I who just sit there quietly to embrace this experience of being in a room filled with fans as those lights go down and we all go on a journey together and we feel the emotions of the movie itself. We laugh when things are funny. We cry when things are intense. We cheer when things are unbelievable. Like those kinds of fans are the exact kinds of fans I want to see movies with. And those are the kinds of fans who are going to brave it shortly after the pandemic and make their way back into theaters. So really, the hardcore movie buffs, the people who really, really, really love this stuff, they're going to be the ones packing those theaters. So I don't know about you, but I can't wait to get to a movie when this is all over. And like even Jenkins herself said, you know, this will end at some point. She was not supporting this as an indefinite solution. This is just to make do with what's happening right now. So there will be another side to all this when life is somewhat back to normal and we can start going back to theaters. And in that new normal, I suspect we're, those theaters are going to be packed with people who love this stuff, who take it seriously and treat it with the majesty and pomp and circumstance of going to the movie. It, treat it with what it should be. Because over the years, it's just gotten more and more casual and more and more laid back. There used to be a time people dressed up to go to the movies. Going to the movies like going to the theater. It was a big deal. The old movie houses had big red velvet curtains. It was a fancy thing. You had ushers. You had people in bow ties. It was, it was a big, beautiful thing. And slowly over the last 80 years, it devolved into a bunch of kids running around screaming in the front row and the couple behind you talking. And it devolved into this uber casual where nobody really takes it seriously type of situation where you have parents who are basically just, I want to disconnect from my kids for two hours. So I'm going to take them to a movie and I'm going to take a nap while they run around and we watch and, and while Sonic the Hedgehog is on the screen. You know, the, the, the theatrical experience has already been watered down a great deal for the last several decades. And I suspect that when things return back to normal, it might and should and could feel really special again. And as someone who loves going to movie theaters, for someone to whom going to a movie theater is like going to church, that excites the hell out of me. And it should excite you too. And before I pivot away from Patty Jenkins and you know, remarks she has made this week, I feel like I should touch on some other ones that she made regarding Joss Whedon's version of Justice League. And, uh, well, I've got some opinions. So let me read this. On the subject of Justice League, the theatrical cut, <clears throat> Patty Jenkins said, The Justice League? No, I think that all of us DC directors tossed that out just as much as the fans did. But also, I felt that that version contradicted my first movie in many ways. And this current movie, which I was already in production on. So then, what are you going to do? I was like... You would have to play ball in both directions in order for that to work. The only thing I have done and have always tried to do is I knew when Zack was doing Justice League where she sort of ends up. So I always tried, like, I didn't change her suit because I never want to, I, I don't want to contradict his films, you know? But yet, I have to have my own films. And he's been very supportive of that. And so I think that that Justice League was kind of an outlier. They were trying to turn one thing into kind of another. And so then it becomes, I don't recognize half of these characters. 
I'm not sure what's going on. So on the one hand, I absolutely agree with her remarks about the theatrical cut of the movie. It really did lose all of its identity. It did not feel in any way like the third chapter in the Man of Steel, Batman versus Superman trilogy. And, uh, you know, she's got a great point there about how, you know, DC directors basically kind of wash their hands with it, just as fans seem to have. I mean, it still baffles me that two years ago, before we were doing these epic movie nights at my house, we still had a viewing of Justice League. I remember when I got it on Blu-ray, we checked it out. Actually, I want to say it was like January of 2019. So it might even be like a year ago. Well, almost two years ago. Um... My family saw that movie, and yet when we watched it last week, they all swore they'd never seen it before. That goes to show you how forgettable the theatrical cut was. And now, mind you, this time it had a lot more pomp and circumstance because they had just watched Man of Steel. They had just watched BVS. So Justice League, you know, I guess they, they, they grabbed it a lot better. But they didn't even remember seeing it. So Patty Jenkins will not get any argument from me about whether or not that cut of the movie was worth a damn. But the part of her quote that I find, I don't know, somewhat amusing, if not a tad hypocritical, and this all comes from a place of love. Remember, I'm a huge Patty Jenkins fan. But this bit here in the middle about I don't want to contradict his films, um, I don't buy that. I just don't buy that. Uh, I was discussing this earlier on Thursday over on the Twitter. But if you pay attention to Wonder Woman, especially, remember, I just completed this rewatch. So I just went from BVS Ultimate Edition into Wonder Woman. If you watch Wonder Woman, it's very clear that Jenkins retcons the path that Diana was supposedly on. Because in BVS, when she talks about her history, she talks about a century of horrors. She talks about basically disconnecting from humanity for a hundred years. There are allusions to the fact that she has fought other alien invaders and that she's been around for thousands of years. And yet, what happens in Wonder Woman? In Wonder Woman, she's a rookie hero in 1918 who leaves Themyscira for the first time ever meets Steve Trevor, gets involved with World War I, and then after his sacrifice, she decides that humanity is worth it and they're worth fighting for because while they may be ugly and corrupt and capable of atrocities, at the end of the day, the human heart is worth it and valuable and a beautiful thing. That's her arc in that movie. There's nothing in there that says, now I'm going to disappear for a hundred years. You know, even though it's not expressly stated that she kept fighting crime and all that, it's very clear there is zero cynicism at the end of Wonder Woman. All of that jaded stuff that she says in BVS in the present day, all that jaded stuff, none of that is present at the end of Wonder Woman. At the end of Wonder Woman, we're we're asked to check out enemy soldiers hugging each other after the war is over. You know, it's a whole statement that's the least cynical thing in the world. That movie is all about how love saves us all, about how humanity is worth fighting for, and how even though there are corrupting, mitigating factors, that people at their core are good and we deserve to fight for them. You know, we need to fight for them. You know, that, that was kind of her stance on all of that stuff. So that does not jive at all with things that came up in BVS. It just doesn't. And we also know that there were reshoots. There were things that had to happen in Wonder Woman after the fact that they felt the need to add. You know, Gal Gadot had to come back and film pregnant, and they had to shoot around her pregnancy because they had to get some other new bits into the film when they decided to change the way that f- story develops. You know, because I do think, in hindsight, I believe the original ending, but pre-reshoots, the original ending was much more like the death of Steve Trevor and the atrocities of World War I really do kind of put her off and she kind of disappears at the end. It ends on a sort of like somber note. 
But they decided that rather than having Steve's death and World War I turn Diana off and push her away, remember, she's new in this movie. Unlike what it was stated earlier on, like she's this goddess who's been around for thousands of years. Unlike that, this is a Diana who just left Themyscira like a week ago. So this is a brand new hero. And rather than give this impression that now she's going to turn her back on humanity for a century, we end with her beginning her superhero career. There's nothing that makes us, there's nothing she says to Ares. There's nothing that she says in the narration to us, the audience at the end of that movie that implies she's anywhere on the arc that we heard about in BVS. So I just bring all this up to say, you know, uh, Miss Jenkins, you know, with all due respect, I, I mean, I have all the respect in the world for you as a filmmaker and as a storyteller. But this whole bit about not wanting to contradict Snyder's films, I mean, it just it sounds like, uh, I don't know, you, you, you're trying to to butter up both sides and you're trying to play to his specific fan base or I, I don't know what it is. I mean, a part of me has a conspiracy theory, if you want to hear it for a second. Uh, a part of me wonders of one of the reasons why she's now suddenly acting like Zack's canon is so important to her. I wonder if part of that is because Zack Snyder's Justice League is an overall bigger deal and being treated with much more importance than we might have originally thought. You know, originally this just seemed like, okay, they're going to release the alternate cut on HBO Max. It'll be a standalone experience. It's going to be a thing that you can watch there if you just want a different take on Justice League. But I wonder now, Maybe the other d filmmakers here within the DC roster, maybe the current crop of DC storytellers now realizes that Zack Snyder's Justice League really is going to be more of a centerpiece and more of a focal point of DC on film going forward. And therefore, we need to show more reverence towards Zack Snyder's vision. Maybe that's why she said that. Maybe you know she wants to make sure that her and Zack are cool and her and Zack's fan base and all that sort of stuff that we're all nice and copacetic and getting along gloriously because Zack Snyder's Justice League is really just the beginning of something. So to continue to try to uh, distance yourself from Snyder perhaps is not the smartest play right now. So a part of me wonders if that's why she said that or maybe she just, you know, I, I, I don't know. But I had to address that because this whole thing about not contradicting Snyder's films, it's like, well, Miss Jenkins, you've already done that. Not to mention, in Wonder Woman 1984, I mean, I haven't seen the movie, so this is all purely speculation. But there's lots of scenes that look like she's out in public. In fact, in like broad daylight in Washington, D.C., running through the streets as the streets are packed with civilians and there's policemen everywhere. Like, it's not like she's you know, fighting crime from the shadows like Batman and keeping a low profile, she's out and about in the 80s. So again, this whole idea that she turned her back on humanity for a hundred years, I mean, neither one of Patty Jenkins' films seem to address that. And listen, <clears throat> if I end up being wrong, if they play this off in Wonder Woman 1984, like somehow that entire century that she was supposedly away, she was still helping just quietly, then listen, then by all means, I buy it. I get it. I'm sorry for accusing you of retconning. But between the end of Wonder Woman <clears throat> and what we've seen so far with Wonder Woman 1984, it really seems like Jenkins is very, very comfortable taking some substantial creative liberties with how this Diana is portrayed. Something else that's interesting this week is that Joe Manganiello is making headlines again now that he's just completed some more uh, filming as Deathstroke for Zack Snyder's Justice League. He's had some comments. He's recently sort of re revealed what the original plans were for him and for his Batman movie that he was going to be making. And he also inadvertently kind of confirmed some reporting on my, you know, some old reporting from back in the day. But yeah, he, con he, he confirmed that Joss Whedon reshot that post credit scene, namely all of Eisenberg's parts of it, to include a tease 
for what would become either, you know, the, the Legion of Doom or the Injustice League, however you want to call it, this idea of a super-powered group of baddies, or rather a group of super baddies, that would become the villains in Justice League 2. Because remember, they were no longer trying to build towards Darkseid. You know, Justice League, by the time Whedon was done with it, it was setting up a Justice League 2 where these heroes fight a group of other, you know, uh, anti-heroes, you know, of, of, of their arch nemesis. How do you pluralize nemesis? N nemesis? So, you know, it, he, he confirmed that which was pretty nice, and it's too bad that, that that whole idea ended up getting scrapped because as an alternate plan, I'm totally for that. You know, like, I'm cool now that we're going to get to see the dark side invasion or, or at least, you know, some of that in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now that I know that that's coming, I still feel comfortable admitting, though, that, like, the alternate path also sounded pretty badass, you know, if they were going to find a way, because we haven't really seen that, right? We, we've seen the Avengers take on, you know, and, I, and I'm just using them as a, as a comparison, because if you're talking Justice League movies, the only other thing that comes close are Avengers movies. And the Avengers movies, we're used to seeing them face off against like one key villain and then maybe a couple of mini bosses who work for him. You know, a couple of lower level, but somewhat notable from the comics henchmen like Thanos had, right? But, we, you know, it's mainly been this focus of like five or six people against one main evil entity. This idea of all of our heroes facing off against all of their top villains and having to kind of like split the team apart. You'd have to imagine that the heroes would have to go deal with their own, you know, bad guy at, at a certain point throughout the movie. And then we realize they're all working together and they have to come together. And what is it that they're doing to when the, when the villains pool their resources? What is it that they're creating that that requires the entire Justice League to come together? So listen, as an alternate path, I think that would have been a real cool way to go. Because we've already seen the whole heroes fighting an intergalactic baddie thing. We've seen that a few times, not even just in superhero movies. You know, fighting the big intergalactic baddie is a thing we've seen as a trope in big budget action pictures for many, many years. But to see a team versus a team, that would be kind of cool, I think. Um, but yeah, so Manganello confirmed that. And he also talked about the fact that his Batman movie, the one that he was going to do with Ben Affleck, um, was going to involve his Slade Wilson killing a bunch of important people to Bruce Wayne and basically setting up a big confrontation between Batman and Deathstroke. And, you know, I, I got to admit, I got to admit to you something. I really don't know much about Deathstroke. I really don't. Since I'm not like a huge uh, comic book uh, junkie, um, my only real exposure to him is in the Arkham Origins Batman game. You know, Batman Arkham Origins, whatever it's called. You know, that, that amazing couple of boss fights that Batman has with Deathstroke and the way he's portrayed in that game. That is the bulk of my exposure to the character. That and the quick little tease at the end of Justice League. So I don't really have a huge opinion about or you know about whether or not that that is a legitimate storyline for them to adapt for this movie. You know, I would I like to see it? Sure. You know, I, I'm a Batfleck guy. And if that's the story that he wanted to tell, if that's the story that Jay Oliva was saying was the greatest Batman script he'd ever read, then of course I want to see it. Especially because I don't like to judge things based on a concept, you know, based on like the one sentence description of it that somebody else is talking about. You know, you can't really go off that. I know that in this day and age of social media and fans freaking out about every little detail all the time, we're used to responding to the slightest kernel of information with the biggest, most outlandish hot takes in the world. But in terms of, you know, just hearing this basic plot, I mean, listen, it sounds pretty dark. It sounds pretty violent. It sounds pretty mature. 
But it sounds like it fits with the types of movies that they're making. You know, when you look at the unrated cut of BVS, when I assume one day we'll see David Ayer's Suicide Squad, it's pretty clear that Ben Affleck's Batman occupied a darker space than other Batman that we've seen on the big screen before. So the idea that his movie would also tread on sort of, you know, uh, darkly violent, complex situations where, you know, his Robin is dead and maybe Alfred is dead and Gordon is dead and he's dealing with all this loss. I mean, you know, I, I, it, it makes a lot of sense. It doesn't exactly shock me that that's, that that was the direction Affleck was taking things. Um, and listen, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you can't base much based on just the concept being described. It's all about the execution of the plot. And the storyteller in this case would have been Ben Affleck. So even though I may not fully get, you know, the, the story, the Deathstroke, you know, the Deathstroke killing people off and all that sort of stuff. Well, even though I may not necessarily relate or be dying to see that, uh, I would be dying to see what a storyteller like Ben Affleck would do with that story. And if he were properly motivated, and if that was really the, the direction he wanted to go... You better believe I'd give him a chance and check it out. So, you know, we'll see what happens one day. It seems very unlikely that we're going to see Affleck back under the cowl, you know, after the Flash movie, because the guy keeps on adding new films, you know, new projects to his upcoming you know, plans. So where exactly is he going to find the time to film a Batman miniseries, you know? Um, but listen, stranger things have happened. And I have pointed out before that one of the funny things about this Batman is that a lot of the stuff people love, a lot of the physicality, like that warehouse scene, you know, a lot of the stuff that people really cling to, getting to see Batman in action, that's not even Ben Affleck in the suit. That's Richard Citrone, you know? So technically, this is kind of like my way of like, hmm, maybe there is a way. But technically... Affleck wouldn't really have to be on set that much. You know, if you film it a certain way, you know, he really only has to show up to do like the connective Bruce Wayne scenes. But for all the Batman stuff, you could pretty much just have a double, you know, I mean, aside from some few key close ups and things. So you'd have to think that there would be an efficient way, a cost effective and efficient way to get a Batman movie or miniseries with Affleck in it. You know, there would be a way to do it, but um, I don't know. I guess we're just going to have to wait and see, right? We're going to have to wait and see how Zack Snyder's Justice League turns out. We're going to have to wait and see if David Ayer's Suicide Squad does make it to HBO Max. And then we're going to have to see what the overall interest in the character is like when that's all over. And we also need to see what kind of depiction he's given in that Flash movie. Because if it's true that one of the reasons he's coming back for The Flash is so that his character can get a proper send off so we could properly say goodbye to that version of the character, then I really don't think there's any chance we're going to see any continued adventures of Affleck on HBO Max. So there's a lot of variables up in the air. I know that there's been, you know, there's lots of hope that it'll happen. And I get questions all the time. Hey, Bat of Gotham, I know you mentioned it on Twitter. And uh, listen, you know, I don't think it's the most realistic, op you know, possibility in the world. But at, by the same token, though, I would absolutely lose my mind if they found a way to do it. So I'm kind of in a tough spot where like my mind says, unlikely. My heart says, please make it happen. Um... But yes, I, I, I did want to touch on that. And it's a shame, you know, Joe Manganiello, anytime an actor is super motivated and super locked into a character and very invested in that character's story. You know, he, he's spoken about this origin movie that he wanted to tell with Gareth Evans for a long time. You know, director Gareth Evans of uh, The Raid. You know, he's, he, he's hyped up what, what that movie would have been a couple times. And most recently he added, you know, every, anyone I've told about it has gone crazy for the idea of this origin story. So, you know, when I hear that an actor is that committed to a role, 
and had already sort of got the ball rolling where a studio said, okay, we're interested in making a movie about you. And then that opportunity disappears. Uh, you know, that always, uh, I always end up pulling for that actor. I always want to see like, what is it that they wanted to do with this role? Let's give them a chance. I'd like to see what it was that sparked them with so much inspiration to begin with. So Listen, I don't think we're seeing that Deathstroke movie. And I should mention, just as a side note, before we switch on over to some exciting Marvel news, I feel like we sh I, I should note that last week when we saw Justice League, when we were watching the post credit scene, my daughter asked me, we, we saw Deathstroke, you know, step out of that boat to go talk to Lex Luthor. And she sees Deathstroke and she goes, is that Deadpool? And I just thought, oh, my God, the things I could tell you, the things I can explain about the relationship between Deathstroke and Deadpool. You know, young one, you have much to learn. But I just wanted to share that with you because that was pretty funny. She sees him. And she's like, is that Deadpool? No, honey, it's not. <laughs> but now I got to change gears. I got to change things up because another shoe has dropped. When it comes to this next Spider-Man movie, another shoe has dropped because it is now, I mean, it's been confirmed that Alfred Molina from Spider-Man 2, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 2, you know, the one starring Tobey Maguire and, and Kirsten Dunst, that Alfred Molina is bringing his Dr. Octopus to the new Spider-Man 3 with Tom Holland. So he joins now, you know, Jamie Foxx's Electro and J.K. Simmons' J. Jonah Jameson in terms of previous Spider-Man actors who are now being brought into the fray in the movie that we know is going to include Doctor Strange, who shortly thereafter is heading into the multiverse of madness. So Marvel and this whole multiverse angle that they're getting ready to push is getting more and more intriguing by the minute. Because Alfred Molina was a fan favorite villain. I mean, there are a lot of people who to this day say that Spider-Man 2 is like still one of like the top three comic book movies of all time, if not the best. And it's funny because I wasn't podcasting back then. You know, when that movie came out, when, whenever it was, 15 years ago, I was uh, just a 22-year-old whippersnapper. And I the, the, the thought of podcasting and blogging and all that stuff didn't even occur to me. But had we been having this show back then, you guys would have heard some interesting hot takes from me about Spider-Man 2. I have some complex feelings about that movie, but none of them are about Alfred Molina's portrayal of Otto Octavius. And now that this is all coming out, now that it looks like the next Spider-Man movie is going to be embracing Spider-Man's entire cinematic legacy, it's inspired my wife and I, where we're like, okay, so now, you know, we, we have this long queue of movies for our movie nights, you know, our Friday night movie night extravaganzas. We basically have like a slate. We have our own movie studio and we're designing our own slate, right? And we've got a slate that stretches out a few months already. <laughs> We're already several, many, many, many Fridays into the future in terms of what our programming is going to be. But we've already agreed that the Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy now has to be part of that. Um, A, because my son does love the heck out of Spider-Man. You know, his first love was Spidey. While he's definitely getting much more into Superman now, and you guys should have seen how excited he got last week watching Justice League seeing Superman come back to life and save the day at the end. You should have seen my little boy light up. I needed that, by the way. As a father who was beating himself up for three weeks after watching his son sob uncontrollably and ask him why Superman had to die at the end of BVS, it was so rewarding to see him spring up and get all excited that Superman is back in all his glory. Um... And separate side tangent, I did tell them afterward that, did you like that? Yeah? Cool. There's an alternate version coming out next year for HBO Max, and I showed them the trailer for Zack Snyder's Justice League. I mean, they're intrigued, but my son 
hated the song choice. It was hilarious. As soon as he heard uh, Leonard Cohen go, hallelujah, he looked at me like, what is this? You know, he, he, he's gotten very accustomed to very epic superhero music. He's been listening to, you know, the Hans Zimmer scores from Man of Steel and BVS. He's been listening to John Williams from Superman and Star Wars. He's been listening to Alan Silvestri because we also checked out Back to the Future and he listens to the Avengers theme that Silvestri wrote. So Sebi's used to like seeing these huge cinematic, mythological comic book superhero moments be accompanied with grandiose, almost operatic music. And uh, when he saw, when he heard Hallelujah, when he, as soon as it begins, uh, he just shot me a look like, what the heck is this, Dan? But uh, that was just a tangent to say uh, they actually did enjoy the theatrical cut. And next year, they're going to be checking out the Zack Snyder's Justice League series version of it uh, after Daddy peruses it to make sure that it's not uh, too dark and grim and violent uh, like Ultimate Edition BVS ended up being for them. Um, but back to the subject at hand. Yeah, the Spider-Man trilogy has now been kind of, you know, it's been added to the upcoming slate for us to watch. And I'm kind of excited to revisit those films and see how they've aged for me and if my opinions on them have evolved at all over the years. Um, and more on that in a second. But Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus, uh, I, I always had very, you know, positive, glowing feelings about that iteration of the character. And now the idea of getting to see this prolific actor embody that iconic role again for a sequence that's probably going to blow our minds. I mean, who are we kidding here? If it's true that in the third act or somewhere throughout this movie, Spidey is going to face off with villains from his franchise, from the Amazing Spider-Man franchise, and from the Raimi Maguire franchise, with a high likelihood that Andrew Garfield and Tobey Maguire will be fighting as alternate Peter Parkers by his side? I mean, this is going to be a mind-melting incident. And look, I understand the concerns, because there are concerns. There are legitimate concerns. As soon as you start hearing about all these other actors, and not just the actors, but all the other elements that come into play by having those actors and those characters included in this movie, there is an instinct to go, wait a minute, this is too much. This is getting overblown. This is going to get me a bloated, overstuffed movie. You know, there's lots of people making the jokes like breaking Tom Holland will have a cameo in the Spider-Man 3, which is, by the way, it's, it's an old joke at this point because we were making those same jokes back in the day when BVS was coming out that Henry Cavill has a cameo in Batman versus Superman, right? Because at first it was the announcement about Ben Affleck. Then there was the announcement about Wonder Woman. There was the announcement about all the other Justice League members coming in there. Like there was a lot of that concern too of like, Hey, I thought this was the, the, the continuation of Man of Steel. And meanwhile, we're, we're going to load up his movie with all these other characters. So, there is a tendency to worry, right? There's a tendency that when a movie gets this big and this loaded with big stars and big characters, that we're going to lose the focus, you know, the, the, the central focus on our protagonist, on our mainline star. I get that. But you know why I don't stress? Because Sony Pictures impressed the hell out of me with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Because if you were to think about Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, just on paper, just separate of anything, if you just listed all of the different things that happen in that, the fact that there's like five versions of Spider-Man, you know, involved in it, and that there's all the, you know, that, 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 that this whole just idea of the multiverse and the, the interdimensional travel of all that, I mean, you would not be at all wrong for being worried that that, that, that movie was going to be overstuffed and bloated and confusing. And yet, did you see Into the Spider-Verse? It was filled with heart and emotion, and the emotional core of that movie remained no matter what was going on. No matter the fact that we met two different Peter Parkers. 
no matter the fact that we met, you know, Spider Pig and all these other things, no matter what else was going on, Miles Morales was the central heart of that movie. So that's my only thing here. Sony has already shown that there's a way to tell a Spider-Man story that has a lot of moving parts and still keep the focus on your hero and make your hero the real star of the show. Sony's already shown that. So the question now is, if John Watts and the Marvel creative crew that's coming in to take care of Spider-Man 3, can they do that too? You know, and you've got to think Sony's going to be more hands on with this one than they have in the previous two. You've just got to think, because remember, they pretty much took Spider-Man back after Far From Home. It was a done deal. They were not going to co-produce Spider-Man 3 with Marvel. They already have their own plans. They have things they want this Spider-Man to do. They're setting up Venom. They're setting up Carnage. They've got Jared Leto's Morbius. They have a lot of things in mind already for Spidey. So you've got to think that as part of whatever the negotiations were for Spider-Man 3, Sony's going to have a larger creative presence when it comes to this. And in this particular instance, that doesn't stress me out. I know it sounds shocking because Sony, you know, they kind of screwed things up with the Raimi series, right? After Spider-Man 3, you know, it, it, it ended things on kind of a down note and it was kind of a black eye. Raimi didn't have a great experience with the studio, even ultimately ended up like stuffing Venom in there almost cynically because he didn't really want to do Venom as a villain. You know, then there's all the stuff that happened with Amazing Spider-Man 2. Where again, Sony kind of overstuffed their sequel and they were so focused on trying to get to the Sinister Six and creating a whole mini Spider-Man shared universe that Spider-Man 2 somehow became Batman forever. You know, so Sony doesn't have the greatest track record, but Far From Home was a Marvel Studios Spider-Man movie and I didn't care for it all that much at all. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse was a Sony Spider-Man story, and I adored it. So in this particular case, I am very intrigued to see how Sony and Marvel work together creatively. But the fact that Sony seems to get how to depict Spider-Man in this very similar scenario in a way that keeps Spider-Man as your hero who you're rooting for, who's not just getting lost in the shuffle. The fact that Sony seems to know how to do that, it, ma it makes me hope that they have a larger creative say in Spider-Man 3 than they had in Far From Home, which I, I never thought I'd say. But for whatever reason... The creatives behind Far From Home and, and John Watts himself, you know, the Marvel Studios people who are in charge of Spider-Man thus far have somewhat let me down. So let's see what Sony's influence can do. And I'm not willing to start freaking out about all these other actors because I, I, I suspect there will be more. I suspect there will be some other big announcers. I, I suspect at some point we're going to hear that Maguire and Garfield are confirmed. And I just want you to know, I'm not going to be stressed out when those announcements come out. I'm not going to be like, but what does this mean for Spider-Man? I'm not going to be worried about that. So let's see. Hopefully the script balances everything out. Hopefully Sony and Marvel come up with something really special. And from here, we kind of get to go see what it is that Sony's been cooking up. And we get to see a Maximum Carnage storyline play out with Holland, Tom Hardy, and Woody Harrelson. And we get to see Tom Holland and Jared Leto's Morbius, you know, interact in some way, shape, or form. You know, there's lots of interesting stuff that Sony would like to touch on in the future, that hopefully Spider-Man 3 will prepare us for. And the last thing I'll say on this particular subject before I move on is Sony has some in-house talent that they should really be banking on as their architects for Spider-Man. And this, I think, would put a lot of fears to rest about Spidey's future. And what I'm thinking is this. 
You know, we all talk about people who run the franchise, right? Like Marvel has a Ke- has Kevin Feige, and people love to have all those debates. You know, DC they don't have a Kevin Feige; they should have a Kevin Feige. So and so was trying to be the Kevin Feige. You know, that whole idea of like the- that central figurehead, that main architect. Well, let's try this one on for size. If Sony's really serious about this Spider-Man universe that they want to build out. They should do everything they can to get Phil Lord and Chris Miller as their as their creative architects for all things Spider-Man. Because while they may not have directed Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, we know that their creative fingerprints were all over that. And it was something they were very passionate about. And these are guys with a pretty darn good track record so far. So I would love if if Lord and Miller kind of became the creative figureheads for all things Spider-Man. So I don't know if anyone else agrees with me on that. Feel free to let me know over on the Twitter. And now we're going to be uh, ending this week's episode with a little bit of fun. A little bit of fun. Because uh, my good friend Stephen Marshall, who if you haven't checked it out yet, I mean, he's got a million shows he's a part of. But the one that I was most recently on was the Multiverse Musings vidcast, talking all things Superman between him and Adam Basciano. But Stephen Marshall has sent in a couple of good questions over these last few weeks. And he sent in one last week in particular that I was tempted to answer, but since I spent an entire hour talking Superman with my cousin Brandon last week about, you know, dissecting Superman year one and the different staples of Superman's mythology, I figured let me save this this good Stephen Marshall question for next week. And uh, I also promised I would try to do it in, I would read his question in his accent so, uh, I listen, I'm a man of my word. I'm a man of my word. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and attempt this. So here we go. With the, with the one uh, listener question I will be tackling this week, here's Stephen Marshall. Let's have some fun. It's 1990. WB are thrilled with the, with the success of Tim Burton's Batman. They hire you to make Superman 5, with Chris Reeve returning as the Man of Steel. Who's your villain? What's your story? Who do you cast? Do you recast some roles? Do you have a subtitle? Go. So I hope I did it right, first of all, with your accent, Stephen. Um, But okay, so if I were to do this, my subtitle is going to reveal an awful lot to you. Because my Superman 5, using the context, framing it the way that you asked the question, where Warner Brothers is riding high on Batman 89, and therefore they want to now invest and continue to push forward with, you know, DC cinematic exploits. Well, my Superman 5 would be called Superman 5, World's Finest. Because yes, why not? We're having some fun, right? Who cares about the logistics of the time and whether or not Tim Burton had any interest in going there? You better believe that if I could somehow magically manipulate the situation so that Christopher Reeve's Superman and Michael Keaton's Batman could be in the same movie fighting on the same side, uh, you'd better believe I would do that. So in this sort of like fantasy booking scenario... Uh, No, I wouldn't recast anyone, even though I do think Margot Kidder, by this point, her age gap between her and Christopher Reeve was really starting to become apparent. You know, even in 1987 in Superman 4, I mean, she didn't seem so much like a romantic love interest for Clark as much as like his kindly aunt. You know, and I, I listen, I don't want to, I'm not meant, I'm not trying to disparage the lovely Margot Kidder. I love Margot Kidder and her chemistry with Christopher Reeve is everything. Um, but, you know, it, it was starting to become apparent that she's more of a parent. Anyway, <laughs> but it, it just the age gap was becoming a bit more noticeable. So I guess th- there would be a temptation, I suppose, to recast Margot Kidder. But at this point, I'm not going to go there because I'm not going to try to rack my brains for what actress was around Christopher Reeve's age and might have had a good chemistry and physical type with him back in 1990. You know, I I, I can't quite do all of those mental uh, backflips right now. 
But my Superman world's finest would essentially go a little something like this, where we we primarily open on Batman's quest, or, ra or rather like that really drives the first chunk of the movie, where Batman is hot on the heel. Maybe we shouldn't call it Superman 5 then, if I really want to go a world's finest route. But maybe we just call it Superman world's finest, or just simply world's finest. But the point is this, Stephen. Stop yelling at me. The point is this. Batman is hot on the heels trying to hunt down the Riddler. Remember, we haven't met the Riddler yet. And this would be Burton's Riddler, not Joel Schumacher's Riddler from 1995. We're talking Tim Burton, the type of Riddler that Tim Burton would have created in 1990. A much darker, more gothic. I mean, you saw what he did with Oswald Cobblepot. You know, so his Riddler, granted, it might have become something very literal and on the nose since he seemed to be a big fan of being fairly on the nose with these bat villains, right? Where like Joker has the holes in his face and that's why he has the smile or, you know, Oswald is actually kind of part bird in a way, it seems. So who knows what kind of weird gimmick he would have given Riddler. But in my heart of hearts, it would be Riddler testing the world's greatest detective. The world's greatest detective, in turn, is trying to track him down, and he's following the clues, and he's trying to unravel this mystery. And ultimately, what we would discover is that the Riddler has been in communication with some sort of Kryptonian artificial intelligence of some sort, where he's so obsessed with his quest to be the smartest man in the world, somehow he comes into contact with Brainiac. And at first he thinks Brainiac is an ally. He doesn't realize that Brainiac is ultimately coming here to try to take over Earth. You know, because he comes, he's another Kryptonian, uh, you know, refugee. But at first Riddler would be working, you know, getting information from Brainiac and using the things that he's learning through this artificial intelligence to try to outwit and outmatch Batman and set up a cushy role for himself where brains will finally beat Brawn, where him working with Brainiac will ensure that the eggheads rule the world, not the folks like Batman. And in the meantime, you would have Clark investigating stuff and you would have Superman ultimately have to be the one to deal with Brainiac when he eventually does arrive on Earth in a much more anthropomorphic fashion. And maybe he has his own, you know, invading forces so that you essentially have two stories going on. You have Batman having to deal with Riddler. You have Superman having to deal with Brainiac. And somewhere along the way, there's team-up stuff. Like maybe Batman finishes off Riddler earlier. And then during the alien invasion, there's Superman. And there's Super and then there's Batman in the Batwing shooting down bad guys and helping attack Brainiac's ship or something like that. You know, but that would be my like dream movie. If we can go back to 1990... And try to get that. Oh, and I would totally, if we're in this zone, we're in this zone where anything I want can happen. Right, Stephen? In this zone, I would get the still very much in his prime Richard Donner back into the fray to make this movie. Because remember, that's something that, that, that really chaps my ass after all these years. <laughs> and then we're going to wrap up because I didn't mean to go into this, but just mentioning Donner. With everything that happened during Superman 1 and the turmoil that prevented him from completing his Superman 2, one of the things that really breaks my heart is that Donner was really fired up about Superman. He was really like he he would say in later interviews in hindsight, like when, when he was promoting the Richard Donner cut of Superman 2 back in 2006, he made reference to the fact that him and Tom Mankiewicz, the person who helped take Mario Puzo's script and make it sing the way that it did in Superman the movie, he said that him and Tom Mankiewicz had ideas for like four other Superman movies. And when you look at Richard Donner, 
You know, the only other like franchise he attached himself to back in the day was Lethal Weapon. And he did all four Lethal Weapon movies. Like, this is a guy who likes to see his characters through. This is a guy who, you know, he, he would have stuck there for the long haul. We could have had the guy who gave us the archetype superhero movie from which every other comic book movie ever ha- owes its existence in a way. We would have had that guy overseeing like a four or five movie Superman series. So the mere fact that he was at one point so creatively alive and so excited to be working with the last son of Krypton and using uh, and, and, and further developing and exploring the adventures of Kal-El, a part of me would have loved to have then been like, all right, Richard, we're, we want to make the biggest best Superman movie ever. It's 1990. Batman 89 just came out. We would love to have Batman and Superman on screen together. Clearly you, Richard, know how to deal with mismatched pairs because of Lethal Weapon. So now let's see you work some of your magic on the world's finest. That would be my answer to your question, Stephen. And for everyone... Thank you. That does it for episode 119 of the Fanboy Podcast. I hope you enjoyed this week's show. And until next week, life is chaos. Be kind. Adios. Adios.